Christmas Gospel, or this Christmas Eve, comes from the second chapter of the Gospel of Luke, starting at verse 1. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloth and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And angels of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth. Peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. And so they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. The Gospel of our Lord. Please be seated. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask for your spirit to be poured out on this Christmas Eve day. We pray, Father, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight. Lord, that your spirit would be poured into our lives, that you would open us up to your truth, to the hope, to the peace, the life that is ours through Jesus Christ, this Savior born for each of us. We ask this in Jesus' name. And all God's people say, Amen. Well, there's been a lot of preparations that have been leading up to this day. From the staff, to the worship committee, to the technology committee, and people who give up their time and their energy to uh, decorate and put things up and make this space beautiful. I, I don't even know where we store the decorations. It's kind of pathetic. For this service to happen, it takes a lot of time and a lot of people to come together. So I want to thank everybody who, uh, who did that, who spent time and energy to make this a day, a special day. It's our prayer that you're going to be blessed. That's our prayer tonight, that you'll be blessed, that you'll be renewed in your faith, strengthened in hope, that through this service you'll also come to know the love of God that comes to us through this child, Jesus. Well, we are the only ones that have been preparing for this day. Moms and dads and family members have been busy getting ready. There are are a few of you right now whose minds are drifting off and you're going through the list that needed to happen before you left for this service wondering if you got everything done and you're spinning and telling yourself over the 10 things that need to happen when you get home I invite you to stop to rest to be fed here rest now for a few moments You've been preparing for this day, this year, and I know you want it to go well. You want to pull off and bless your family with good food and a comfortable home with joy and with some peace. So, so many of you have done so much for your families to make this a special night. I remember 
One holiday where we were passing the dessert around after having finished the meal, and my mother stood up and exclaimed, the beans! <laughs> we had forgotten about the green beans that were being kept warm in the oven. And so we had dessert and green beans. <laughs> I'm sure that's the last thing you want to happen. You want everything perfect. There's a lot that goes into planning and pulling off a Christmas feast, a Christmas family gathering. But all our preparation and planning pale in comparison to the preparation and planning that God has done to bring about this day and this night. Many of us have spent months or more working out the details of this day. Well, God has spent hundreds and thousands of years getting ready for today. Is that possible? Could God really have spent that kind of time on today? Well, I want to just take a few moments and look at the things that God has done to bring us here now. The Old Testament contains a number of prophecies to show us just how long God has been working on this night. Now, don't worry, I'm not going to go through all of them. There's a lot. But I do want to hit some key texts so that you understand and can see, in part, some of the preparation that God has gone through to bring Christmas to us here. So let's start in Isaiah. Pastor Kelly read from Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah is a, is a, is a book in the Old Testament. He's one, he's one of the major prophets. And we've read him from time to time over the last month of the Advent season. We've read Isaiah. I mentioned over that time in the last month that the book of Isaiah is the most quoted Old Testament book in the New Testament. It's the most quoted Old Testament book in the New Testament. In fact, Isaiah is sometimes called the Messianic prophet or the prophet of the Messiah because he speaks so often about Jesus prophesied about Jesus coming. Isaiah lived 700 years before Jesus was born. In fact, in Luke chapter 4, when Jesus returns to Nazareth at the beginning of his ministry, when Jesus returns to Nazareth, to his hometown, and he goes to the synagogue, and in the synagogue they want Jesus to read something, and they hand him a scroll, they hand him a book. Do you know what book Jesus opens up and reads from? He reads from the prophet Isaiah. He reads Isaiah chapter 61, and he says to them, this day, this has been filled in your presence, and sits down. And there's a conversation that ensues, and it doesn't go very well by the end. But he reads the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah 61. He says, I say that to help you understand that Isaiah wasn't written after Jesus, and then sold to us as a book that came before him. It wasn't written to make Jesus' story more believable or more fantastic. The oldest complete copy of the book of Isaiah, the oldest complete scroll that we have, comes from the Dead Sea Scrolls that were found in the 1940s in a tomb by some Bedouin shepherds. And those scrolls, there were two full copies of the book of Isaiah. One was 50 B.C., the other was written 150 years before Jesus was born. And we know Isaiah was writing 700 years before he was born because of the history and the timelines and the kings and who, what was happening in the history of Israel. In Isaiah, we find the prophecies that are directly related to this Christmas story, 700 years before it happens. Isaiah chapter 7 says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, God with us. In Isaiah 9 and 11, we hear about Jesus' lineage, that he will be born of the house and the line of David. It will talk about his reign on David's throne. And those are just some of the places in Isaiah that talk about Jesus' birth. There's a whole bunch more that talk about his ministry and his purpose and his death and his kingdom. We discover from the prophet Micah in the book of Micah in the Old Testament, prophecies also concerning the birth of Jesus. Like Isaiah, Micah lived about 700 years before Jesus was born. And in Micah, it talks about where Jesus will be born. In fact, in the Christmas story, in Matthew chapter 2, when the wise men come to Herod and they say, hey, we've, we've come to, to worship the king of the Jews. Remember, and Herod gets real nervous and he says to his, his, the chief priest and the, and, the, and the teachers of the he says, where is Jesus supposed to be born? 
And you know where they go to? They go to Micah chapter 5. Micah chapter 5. Because here's what it says in Micah 5. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be a ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. You see, in the verses, the chief priests quote Micah at Jesus' birth, that Bethlehem is where the king will be born. Both Micah and Isaiah are great indicators of how long God has been preparing for Jesus' birth, but we can go even deeper into the story to see that it's even been longer than that. That God has been preparing even before 700 years before Jesus was born. I just told you that Micah prophesied Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. Well, that town wasn't chosen randomly. And it wasn't chosen by Micah. God gave Micah the prophecy. God had long before Micah prepared Bethlehem to be the place where Emmanuel, God with us, Jesus, would be born. And all we have to do is look into a, a little deeper into this whole Bethlehem thing. Look into the history of Bethlehem to see that God is doing something amazing here. Long before he told Micah to prophesy where Jesus would be born. Are you still with me? Bethlehem is where Jesus was born. In Hebrew, do you know what it means? Some of you. House of bread. Coincidence? Born in a town called House of Bread would come out of that place, the bread of life. In John chapter 6, Jesus himself says about himself, I am the bread of life. Remember at the Last Supper when he has his disciples around him, Jesus takes bread, he breaks it, he gives thanks, and he gives it to his disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Coincidence? Well, Jacob, one of the forefathers of the faith, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the promise is being given. Uh, God is going to uh, make a people for himself. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob loved a wife named Rachel. It was his dearly loved wife, Rachel. I'm not going to get too deeply into this, but Rachel would die giving birth in Bethlehem. She's buried there. Jesus would be born in Bethlehem and give die and would die giving birth to the church to us, making it possible for us to have access to God, to have new life and hope. Remember Ruth? Remember Ruth and Naomi? Naomi the mother-in-law and Ruth says to her mother-in-law, wherever you go, I'll go. Your people will be my people. Remember the story of Ruth? And they leave where they're at because their husbands die, and Ruth follows this mother-in-law where she goes, and she comes back. And you know, where they, you know where they end up? Bethlehem. And they meet Boaz. And Boaz becomes Ruth's and Naomi's kinsman redeemer. Somebody who agrees to marry Ruth, draws her into the family, redeems her at Bethlehem. At Bethlehem, Ruth would become a bride and be redeemed. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. He would be born to redeem us, and it is where Jesus, the groom, Scripture talks about him as the groom, and we, the bride. Coincidence? Who's the most... most Kind of, probably if you think the king of Israel, so the, the king of Israel is going to come to your mind right away. To me, it's always King David. Maybe it's because of my name. But. King David. And remember, Jesus is the line, the lineage of King David. King David is Jesus, I think it's his 39th great grandfather or something like that. King David is Jesus' 39th great grandfather. David, the shepherd boy, was anointed as king of Israel by the prophet Samuel. Guess where? Bethlehem. Jesus is born in Bethlehem. He will be the king of kings. And scripture will refer to him as the good shepherd. 
Coincidence? At one point in God's story of Bethlehem, Bethlehem is in the hands of the enemies, and King David is the ruler. And they're outside of the city of Bethlehem, David and his army. And, what, and the thing that David longs for more than anything, he says to, to some of his fellow compatriots, he says, Oh, that I could have a drink from the well at Bethlehem where he grew up. Oh, if I could just taste the waters where I was born. <coughs> and a couple of his guys, of his, of his soldiers, make their way in, and they get to Bethlehem, and they bring David back some water from the well at Bethlehem. He's refreshed there. Jesus was born in Bethlehem, and Jesus promises us, he says it to the, to the, good, the, the, the Samaritan woman at the well, I'll give you living water that refreshes, that quenches. You see, these events, Jacob, Ruth, David, they took place over a thousand years before Jesus was born. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Do you think all of that is mere coincidence? Or do you think that God was preparing Bethlehem to receive Jesus? That, in a sense, God was marking Bethlehem as a special place where he would do great things. I believe that God was weaving into the place of Bethlehem the story of Jesus, the story of salvation. Before Jesus was even born, Bethlehem would already bear the marks of the Savior that would be born in Bethlehem. As we look at the story of the Savior, we can see the hands of God shaping and preparing the world for the birth of Jesus, for the salvation that's found in him. You see, either all the prophecies and all the happenings that point to Jesus as Savior are totally random coincidence. Or they're true. And they're intentional. Intended by God for us. Intended for us to see. I believe it's God's way to reveal to those with eyes to see and ears to hear. Listen to this. I believe that it is God's way of revealing to those with eyes to see and ears to hear the truth that Jesus is the one, the Son of God, the Savior that we long for and that we all need. Which brings us back to this day, to this Christmas. You see, I don't believe that all of those events that I just spoke of were merely God's way of leading us up to the first Christmas. I believe those events and more are God's way of leading up to this Christmas. What, what, do, you, what do you mean, Pastor Dave? Well, let me ask you this. Do you think that it's a coincidence that you're here tonight? I don't. I've been praying for you. I've been praying for every single one who come to me. The story of God didn't end at Jesus' birth. The story of Jesus of God's salvation is still happening. God has been shaping and preparing and getting ready for you to be here tonight. For you to hear about his love for you that is revealed through Jesus, the salvation that is ours through Jesus Christ. The preparation for tonight started about a day or a month or even a year ago. It started a long, 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 long time ago. The story of Christmas is the story of a saving, loving God coming for his children. It is one story all woven together with the intention of getting to your ears and into your heart tonight. So that you too can come into God's presence with joy and thanks. As obsessed as we can, as obsessed as we can be about Christmas being perfect or having everything right for the celebration, in light of the truth about why we're actually here, none of that stuff really matters. I hate to tell you. 
I hate to break it to you. Let me tell you something. The beans can get left in the oven until dessert. The, ha the ham can become a hockey puck. The presents can be too small or all need to be returned. The family can start talking about politics and get in a huge disagreement, but none of it can ruin Christmas. The only thing that can ruin Christmas is if God spends 4,000 years of human history and longer of his own history to bring you to this night to hear this message and have you miss it or turn away. This night is all about God wanting you to receive his gift of love and salvation. And the gift has a name. It is Jesus. The only thing that can truly ruin Christmas is to have you pass off. But I've just told you about God's preparing for the night, knowing that you'd be here, to pass that off, that truth off, as mere coincidence, or worse yet, nonsense. Tonight, God comes with a child in his hand. He comes to lay that child in your heart and in your life. That child is the Savior, yours and mine. He comes to the hurting and the doubting and the lost and the scared and the lonely and the sinful and the dying. Did I miss anyone? Because I'm in there. He comes to you and me with salvation. His son Jesus, who was born and lived and died and was raised from the dead so that we could live abundant and eternal lives. God's preparation for this night comes together and it all leads up to you. Will you receive his gift tonight? Ephesians chapter 2 says it like this. Ephesians 2, 4. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace you've been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Jesus Christ in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not your doing, your own doing. It is a gift of God. God has been preparing a long, long time for you to be here. And he stands holding out a gift. Will you take it? My parents loved to prepare for the holidays. And getting things ready for us kids, they just adored it. And they loved to watch us open up our gifts. <laughs> Having kids of my own, I, I understand that now in a way I maybe didn't before. Our Heavenly Father loves to prepare to get all ready and to give good gifts. And above all, he loves when all his preparing comes together in a way that his children receive and open and enjoy the gift that he has for them. If you're a, a long time faithful follower of Jesus, then you know that receiving Jesus isn't a one time event. It's a daily need. It's a process of dying to yourself and allowing Jesus to be born in you day in and day out to live in you. And so I invite you to receive again tonight this gift from God, Jesus, as your Lord and Savior. And if you have never received this awesome gift from God, the salvation that comes through Him, then I invite you tonight to simply open up your arms Open up your lives. Soften your hearts. Preparation has been going on for a long time for you to hear this. He loves you. 
and he has a gift. His name is Jesus. It's for you. From God. Merry Christmas. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, whether we're long-time followers who love you and seek you or first-time hearers of the word, the truth of your love. Lord, open up our hearts to receive them. Unclasp our hands. Open up our hands, Lord, and lay this child, lay this child in our arms that we might know the hope peace, the joy, and the love that is ours through Jesus Christ. Lord, you've been preparing a long time for each of us to be here. I pray that we would receive and open the gift. Pour out your spirit. Fill us. May this night be blessed. We ask this in Jesus' name and all God's people say,